Welcome. This is Majesty Sussex Report. I'm Antonio. Thank you for spending some of your valuable time with us today. The article by Jack Boyston in Newsweek discusses Meghan Markle's actions while Queen Elizabeth II was suffering from bone cancer. As revealed in Boris Johnson's memoir, it highlights Meghan's public statements during this period, such as her podcast on the fire incident in Prince Archie's nursery during their South Africa tour, and her interview with The Cut. Royston suggests these statements were veiled criticism of the royal family. Really? Which some may view as awkward given the Queen's health at the time. So, Megan is doing her thing, talking about her experience. She doesn't know what the Queen has in regards to her illness, but because she's speaking her truth, others are finding it awkward, and you're suggesting also that it's Megan's way of having a like, like a go to the, okay let me continue this little summary here the article also references prince harry's final phone conversation with the queen and boris johnson's detailed observations about her illness overall johnston royston's attempts to link megan's actions to the queen's final months in a way that cast megan in a negative light surprise surprise yeah. The recent Newsweek article by Jack Royston, titled Meghan Markle's Royal Revelations as Queen Was Dying of Cancer, is yet another attempt to smear Meghan Markle, and frankly, it falls flat. It reads like a collection of desperate musing, struggling to piece together disjointed points in an effort to paint Meghan in a negative light. If this article was intended to promote Boris Johnson's book, it failed. If it was meant to be a review of Boris Johnson's work, it also failed. But most significantly, if the goal was to present an insightful perspective on recent events, the article is a complete disaster. First, the article's lack of coherence makes one question its purpose. Boris Johnson himself, during an appearance on GB News with Camilla Tomini, praised both Harry and Meghan. Yet, this important context is completely omitted, leaving readers with a narrative that is skewed misleading and completely divorce or divorce sorry from the actual events by ignoring boris's praise uh, the article not only distorts his message but also undermines the credibility of the author's argument this selective presentation of facts is not just misleading but also an intentional effort to manipulate readers into forming a biased opinion against Megan. The media has a responsibility to present accurate and complete information, and failing to do so is a disservice to the public. If the article was meant to be a critique or review of Boris Johnson's book, it falls dramatically short of any journalistic standards. Instead of delving into book content, offering readers meaningful insights or a balanced review, 
the author shifts focus to, guess who, Megan, using her as a scapegoat to generate clicks to stir controversy. This isn't journalism. It's an attempt to capitalize on public fascination by once again demonizing a woman who has, time and time again, faced undue scrutiny. This kind of reporting is not only unethical, but also reflects a broader trend of targeting outspoken women, especially women of color, in an effort to silence their voices. The timing of this article is also highly suspect. Meghan Markle's recent appearance at the Children's Hospital LA Gala was nothing short of inspiring. She looked radiant and her genuine support for the cause was evident to all who watched. Megan's efforts to uplift children and raise awareness for important issues garnered positive media attention, and rightly so. But in a classic example of the media's fixation on tearing down Megan, whenever she received praises, <laughs> There's always a backlash. This article conveniently appeared as if to remind readers not to think too highly of her. It is disheartening to see how Megan's positive actions are consistently overshadowed by baseless attacks, as if her every accomplishment must be countered with negativity to maintain a certain narrative. The article itself reads like a frantic attempt to make connections where none exist, a collage of misinformation aimed solemnly at dragging Megan down. It fails to articulate any clear point, instead throwing together Boris Johnson, Megan, and unrelated events to somehow concoct a, a, a narrative that, that is filmsy at best. For example, the author tries to imply that Megan's podcasts and interviews were inappropriate simply because Queen Elizabeth II was ill at the time. Information that Megan herself may not have even known. This kind of reporting is not only lazy, but also harmful, as it perpetuates the negative stereotypes and biases that Megan has faced for years now. The implication that Megan should have somehow known the exact and the extent of the Queen's illness and adjust her actions accordingly is both unreasonable and unfair, especially given the strained dynamics between the Sussexes and the rest of the royal family. But this is what they always want the Sussexes to do. Somehow they should reschedule all of their things to please members of the royal family. Another glaring issue with the article is the way it mischaracterizes Megan's comments about, an example, the incident involving Prince Archie's room heater uh, catching on fire during their South Africa store. Megan spoke about this heroin experience in her podcast, emphasizing the fear and distress she felt as a mother knowing her child's room had caught fire while they were expected to continue with their royal duties. When you went and played that match the next morning, no one knew what your night had been like the night before. They forgot that human piece of it. Yeah. Just like when we went on our tour to South Africa, we landed with Archie. Archie was, what, four and a half months old? And the moment we landed, we had to drop him off at this housing unit that they had had us staying in. He was going to get ready to go down for his nap. We immediately went to an official engagement in this township called Nyanga. 
And there's this moment where I'm standing on a tree stump and I'm giving this speech to women and girls and we finish the engagement, we get in the car and they say, there's been a fire at the residence. What? There's been a fire in the baby's room. What? Stop. God, I can't believe we haven't talked about this. No. And so we're in the car. We had just landed. We had just landed. At what, an hour or two hours before, racing back. We get back, our amazing nanny, Lauren, who we'd had all the way until we, um, in Canada here. Lauren, in floods of tears, she was supposed to put Archie down for his nap. And she just said, you know what? Let me just go and get a snack downstairs. And she was, was Lauren's from Zimbabwe, and we loved that she would always tie him on her, her back with a mud cloth. And her instinct was like, let me just bring him with me before I put him down. In that amount of time that she went downstairs, oh my God. Oh my the gosh. heater in the nursery caught on fire there was no smoke detector someone happened to just smell smoke down the hallway went in fire extinguished he was supposed to be sleeping in there and we came back Mm. and of course as a mother you go oh my god what just are everyone's in tears everyone's shaken and what did we have to do Mm. go out and do another official engagement i said this doesn't make any sense can you just (sighs) How did you not bring him? I was like, can you just tell people what happened? And so much, I think, optically, the focus ends up being on how it looks instead of how it feels. And part of the humanizing and the breaking through of these labels and these archetypes and these boxes that we're put into is having some understanding on the human moments behind the scenes that people might not have any awareness of and to give each other a break. Because we did. We had to leave our baby. And even though being moved into another place afterwards we still had to leave him and go and do another official engagement i couldn't have done that i was uh, uh, oh was, I, yeah, well <laughs> that just made me realize how much i miss archetypes it was such a good podcast it's absolutely phenomenal gosh i miss it Ah, yes. Greetings, my esteemed viewers. I trust you're mildly entertained by today's episode of Majesty Sussex Report. I mean, it's not quite tea with the Queen, not that Queen, the other Queen. Thank you. But one does what one can, doesn't one? Now, before you get too comfortable, might I remind you to bestow a like upon this humble video? Oh, and subscribing, well, it's terribly fashionable, you know. All the royals are doing it, or so I've heard in the servant halls. And as for that notification bell, well, ring it if you must. It ensures you don't miss our thrilling gossip about the Duke and Duchess of somewhere or another. I do love a good scandal. I mean, (laughs) thoughtful discussion. So go on, engage with the channel, dear. It keeps the gossip flowing. And frankly, who doesn't love a bit of drama? And with that, I bid you farewell, for now. Carry on and do be sure to come back, won't you? Oh, dear. Sometimes I get so excited I forget things. If you would like to support this channel financially, you can do so by sending a super thanks of super sticker. Thank you. But this interpretation is entirely his interpretation, not Megan's. Megan's retelling was not about attacking anyone. It was about sharing an experience that any parent could relate to and the emotional toll it took on her. She spoke with honesty and vulnerability and yet the author twists her words to fit a preconceived narrative of Megan being perpetually critical of the royal family. This desperate distortion of her intent is not only unfair, but also an example of how the media continues to manipulate Megan's words to suit their own agendas. Furthermore, Royston draws a comparison between Megan's comment about the fire incident 
and the long-standing practice of taking photos of Prince William and Kate's children on their first day of school. He suggests that Megan's desire for privacy for her children is somehow unreasonable by arguing that similar media coverage has not damaged the Wales' children. But how does he know that? It is pure speculation on his part to assume that the media attention on Prince Archie, as an example, would be no worse than the one received by Prince George or Princess Charlotte or Prince Louis. Given the relentless and often vicious coverage Megan has faced, it is entirely reasonable for her to want to protect her children from similar treatment. Royston's assumption that Prince Archie would not face worse scrutiny is just naive. That's not the word I want to use, but that's the one I will. It's naive at best. And I'll say this intentionally dismissive at worst. The truth is, Megan and Harry have every right to safeguard their children's privacy, especially given the unique challenges and threats they have faced. We, as readers, deserve better. We deserve thoughtful reporting that respects our intelligence and presents events as they are, not as twisted versions designed to suit a predetermined narrative. If the intention was to critique Boris Johnson's book, then do that. If the purpose was to cover Megan's recent charity work, then celebrate the impact of her actions. But this consistent stitching together of unrelated fragments to create yet another attack on Megan is not journalism, folks. It's sensationalism, pure and simple. The media has a powerful influence on public perception. And using that power to unfairly target individuals is not only irresponsible, but also damaging to society as a whole. We must, we must demand higher standards for our media. Standards that prioritize truth and fairness over scandal and controversy. It's time to ask ourselves why these publications continue to target Meghan Markle so relentlessly. Eight years, eight years, almost a decade. The answer seems to lie in the fact that Megan, a biracial woman of color who speaks her mind and stands her ground, challenges the status quo. And rather than celebrating her resilience and contributions, certain media outlets find it easier to tear her down. It's a sad commentary on the state of the media when the accomplishments of a woman who devotes her time to important causes are overshadowed by baseless attacks designed to diminish her. Megan represents a departure from the traditional image of the royal family. And instead of embracing this diversity, the media seems intent on punishing her at every time, every corner, every minute, every second for it.
this relentless attack on Meghan Markle has to stop. It reflects a broader societal issue with those who dare to be different, especially women of color, especially black women, are often met with hostility rather than support. The Newsweek article is not just a failure in terms of content, but also a failure to meet basic standards of fairness and decency. It's time for the media to do better, to offer balance on biased reporting, and to stop targeting Megan simply because her story doesn't fit the narrative they want to sell. The constant vilification of Meghan Markle is not only unjust, but also a reflection of the deep-seated bias that still exists within our society. Instead of tearing her down, we should be uplifting her up and uplifting individuals who use their platform to advocate for positive change. Megan's work with charitable organizations, her advocacy for mental health, and her efforts to raise awareness on important so social issues deserves recognition and respect, not this relentless criticism. The media has the power to shape public opinion and it's high time that power is used to uplift rather than destroy. Okay, so for you not to get curious and want to go read this article, or um, I mean, if you want to do that by by all the means, but I'm gonna I'm gonna save you the time. So I'm gonna tell you exactly. I'm gonna kind of try quickly to go paragraph by paragraph why this is so messed up. So the, the, the article opens by stating that Queen Elizabeth II had been suffering from bone cancer as, reve as, as revealed by Boris Johnson in his memoir. Royston attempts to tie this revelation to Meghan Markle's action during this period, but he fails to make any concrete connection between the Queen's health and Meghan's behavior. Meghan doesn't even know that that the queen has bone cancer. So why would whatever Megan is doing in California be an offense to the queen? The, the article intends, instead becomes quite confusing as it does not clarify why Megan's actions are relevant to the queen's illness, creating a disjointed narrative from the outset. The next paragraph, um, Discussing Harry and Meghan's presence in Britain when the Queen died adds little to support the main argument, Royston notes, that they did not go up to Balmoral to see the Queen, but does not explain why this information is significant. The lack of context leaves the reader wondering why their absence at Balmoral should be viewed negatively. And it feels like an attempt to just paint them in a bad light without sub sub substantive um, uh, uh, reasoning. So the, the reference of Prince Harry's book, Spare, is equally out of place. Royston includes Harry's emotional statement about wishing for one more goodbye, but fails to explain how this relates to the main argument of the article. Instead of proving, or sorry, instead, instead of providing insight, this, this inclusion feels like a, a emotional appeal um, meant to add weight to an otherwise weak narrative. So, Royston then moves on to Megan's statements from her Archetypes podcast and her interview with The Cut, 
suggesting that her remarks were a veiled swipe at the palace. However, Royston does not substantiate his claim with evidence or examples of how these statements were intended to be critical of the royal family. Furthermore, the attempt to link Meghan's comments to the Queen's illness is weak and lack logical comprehension. There is no clear explanation as to why Meghan should have been aware of the Queen's health status or how her statements were insensitive in light of it. The discussion of the fire in Prince Archie's nursery during their South Africa tour is another example of Royston's lack of focus. Megan recounting of the incident was meant to highlight the challenges she faced as a mother. Yet Royston frames this, right, frames it as an attack on the palace. This interpretation is is entirely subjective and unsupported, making it clear that the author is reaching for a negative angle no matter what. The article's inability to provide objective analysis further weakens its, its, its credibility. None, none whatsoever. Royston goes on to compare Megan's comment, Megan's comment about privacy for her children to the long-standing practice of taking photos of Prince William and Kate's children on their first day of school. He implies that Megan's desire for privacy is unreasonable, but offers no evidence to support his claim that media attention on Prince Archie would be no worse than that for the Wells' children. This assumption is speculative and, and dismissive of the unique challenges faced by Meghan and Harry. You know, furthering, um, um, demonstrating a, a, a lack of balanced perspective. The next paragraph on Harry's, on Prince Harry, final phone call with the Queen is another instance where the article lacks focus. Royston's includes details from Harry's book about their conversation, but fails to explain why this information is relevant to the broader narrative about Meghan's actions. The inclusion of this uh, I, I can't say this word. <laughs> um, anecdote, anecdote, thank you, seems intended to evoke emotions rather than provide meaningful context or analysis. Now, Boris Johnson, like, <laughs> finally, Royston includes Boris Johnson <laughs> observations about the Queen's health, detailing her physical state and her, and her determination to continue her duties. While this information is interesting, it does not add to the argument about Megan's behavior. Instead, it feels like an attempt to juxtapose the Queen's resilience with Megan's supposedly insensitivity without making a clear or logical connection between the two. Overall, Jack Royston's article is a riddle with inconsistencies and lacks of, of clear focus. It attempts to tie together <laughs> desperate pieces of information. Megan's public statements, Harry's emotional reflections, and Boris Johnson's observations about the Queen without providing a cohesive and comprehensive narrative. 
The result is a confusing and disjointed piece that seems more interested in casting Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex, in a negative light than in providing a balanced or insightful analysis. Lazy, lazy, lazy. Hate to say it, but this is a fail. Okay, my beautiful people, um, this is it. This is it for today's episode. I, it's just amazing to me, and I'm still, I think, is it the, my mind is still um, amused that this is what they call journalism. Like, it, 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 I started to read, and I kept thinking, how much does this guy get, how much do they pay him? Because I, 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 I would like his job because he, I mean, I don't, I don't want to repeat myself, but he, he's like, what's the, what's, what's the saying? You're something for straws. You're, he's something for straws. Oh, just when I need it, need it. It's not in my head. Um, anyways, ah, <sighs> I will continue to do this. I hope you folks enjoy it. Um, but I will, I'm not going to do it every day all the time, but I will continue to um, look at these articles that are published in, 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 you know, established magazines and call them out. Call them out for their bias and, and, and for misinformation. And frankly, for just... This is, this, is, this is not news, this is not journalism, this is some opinion piece, right? And an opinion that is quite erroneous because you're trying to bring a tiger, a, a, a pigeon, and I don't know, and some kind of cat and, and pretend they're, they're all from the same species. It's just ridiculous, ridiculous. Well, I hope you're all having... Oh, you're about to have a wonderful day wherever you are. And um, I, I, I will be remiss if, if, if I don't say I know there's so much happening in the world. And really, really, really take care of your mental health. Okay? It's really important. Turn off the stuff. Look for a day or something t tomorrow. Turn it on back again if that's what you need to do. But give your brain, your system, you know, a reprieve from what is what has happened. I've been obsessed lately, I'll tell you folks, with um, what has happened with um, Tallahassee uh, um, interview at CBS, the morning show. And if you want to see or watch bias happening like real time in an interview, it is just, I mean, anyways, what I'll do because I just um, heard, I think Trevor Noah also is interviewing him. So I, I want to, you know, watch that. And if I think, you know, not if I think, but I'll, I'll, I'll likely drop the link either here or in the next podcast, in the next episode, um, so you folks can, can watch it also, because I think these conversations are really, really important. And for us to also to be able to, to, to watch and see when establish legacy media and, and on a show where, you know, there is Gail King and so on, and, and he was just allowed to just... <sighs> I, I, I would say it, it wasn't an interrogation of the guests. It was him making assumptions of what he kept saying. Well, you, you mean this, you said this. And if you folks don't know what I'm talking about, I'm so sorry. Um, I will discuss it a little bit more in our next episode. Okay. Take care. Be kind to yourselves, Be kind to your loved ones and Yes, I know, and to that stranger that might be crossing your path, do your very best to be kind to them too. Love you all. 
Thank you for your wonderful support, your wonderful comments and notes. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Take care for now. Ciao, ciao. Everybody wants to give advice, but they just have to see They don't recognize